15 this morning, Romans chapter 14. It's uh, good to see all these strange faces this morning. I don't know where you were Friday and Saturday night, but I guess you're doing something constructive. And uh, all I can say is, all I can say is you miss some things you're never going to hear again. And if it doesn't mean it to you, it's okay, that's the way the snow blows. But you know some people, at the time that's coming to America, when you're going to hear the truth, you're going to hear it in places like this. You're not going to hear it in television. That's right. They don't dare tell you one fifth of the truth. That's right. And these people who came up here Friday to side, sat and heard things that you didn't hear in television, aren't going to hear in television. You sat around that boob tube for 35 years. Right. You see, the bigger audience you get, the less truth you can disseminate. Can you imagine what happened this morning if there were two Jehovah's Witnesses sitting here and two Mormons there and two Buddhists there and two Benai Barith over there and two Muslims over here and uh, two Confucius over here and three Baptists and four Presbyterians and two Christian scientists and four Catholics, what could you say? <laughs> you couldn't say anything. You'd, you'd dent somebody's fender every time you open your mouth. All you could say is share, love, cope, cope, love, share. <laughs> Share, cope, love, love, cope, share, love, cope, share, share, cope, love. Now, a little old building like this sitting out back end of nowhere, this is where you're going to hear the truth. You're not going to any place else. They don't dare tell you. Folks say, well, you're on television. Yeah, I'm on television, but my, my stuff is edited. When you see my stuff on television, that's the Sunday night service at the Bible Baptist Church. That ain't, a, that ain't an evangelistic TV evangelist. That's a pastor in a Baptist church. And my stuff always has to be edited before it goes out. If I'm out there in Texas, goes through my films and beep, 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 beep. <laughs> Cuts out all the stuff that you couldn't get on television. Because <laughs> in America, freedom of speech is gone. All right, now, before I start this morning, I thought I'd bring along my little Alabama orchestra here and play you a couple of tunes, you know, for a special. <laughs> I play something religious on here, so I play you him. <laughs> Things. You always have to play one German tune on there because they're all made in Germany. This is Emma Horner. They turn them out. So I'll play an SS. Uh, I'll play an SS march called the Hohenfriedeberger. If you got a Bible open there, get Romans chapter 14, we'll take verse 12. Uh, it's a famous text in the Bible, one of the most important, and it'll keep you out of all kinds of trouble if you pay some attention to it. And it says, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now that verse will keep you out of more trouble than any verse you get your hands on. That says that your uh, accountability to God is personal. Uh, folks talk about in America, we've lost our Judeo-Christian Judeo heritage. They don't even tell you what it is. They say it's family values. No, it's not. Your Judeo-Christian heritage is that all Orthodox Jews and all Orthodox Christians believe when a fellow dies, he'll be judged 
and the standards he'll be judged by are in that book. You're not allowed to even say that in a public school. An Orthodox Jew that believes you'll die and God will judge you by the Ten Commandments. You're not allowed to publish the Ten Commandments in the school. You lost that heritage completely. It's gone. Bye-bye. A Christian believes you'll die and be faced with the righteousness of Jesus Christ as a standard. Your Judeo-Christian heritage is that you have a right to die and face judgment. That's all the rights you have. Right to income? No, sir. 20-hour a week? No, sir. Medicare? No, sir. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Not, no way, bud. You've earned two things, the right to die and the right to face judgment. And both those values are gone from America and they're not going to come back. Now that thing there says you'll give account of yourself to God. When I first began to preach, almost all my services were in the South. In Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, Mississippi, Carolina, and Texas, around through there. And I heard one alibi for rejecting Christ so often that I thought for a while it must just be indigenous to the Southland. Then I got preaching up in Pennsylvania and New York and Michigan, Ohio and Indiana around through there. And I found out that folks up there talked the same way they talked down south. I mean, the accent might have been different, but they said the same thing. Now, here the conversation goes like this. You stop a fellow and say, are you saved? Well, preacher, I'll tell you what. I don't profess to be no Christian. And no use trying to lie about it. They say that. No use trying to lie about you. I don't know why they say that. I mean, I never asked the guy to lie to start with. <laughs> and the fellow, no use trying to lie about it. I don't live like I ought to live. But I'll tell you one thing. If I ever get saved, I'm going to live a good life and I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I can't stand these hypocrites in the church. And I'd get saved if it wasn't for these hypocrites in the church. They always worry about the hypocrites in the church. And it's a strange thing that I ever worry about them anyplace else. I'm the plenty of hypocrites at a ball game that don't keep you away. There are plenty of hypocrites in the grocery store. You buy your groceries. One place you worry about hypocrites in the church. You say, why is that? Well, those folks in the church profess something. Not necessarily, no. Matter of fact, no, not true at all. Uh, you can go downtown uh, Detroit and stop the first 500 people you want to stop and find out how many of them belong to churches. When you find out, ask how many of them know they're saved or know they're gone when they die. You'll find that over half of them don't profess nothing. But it's a strange thing always what about the hypocrites in the church. I've been in homes where they talked about the hypocrites that uh, smoked. And I've been in homes where they smoked and talked about the hypocrites that believe in mixed bathing. And I've been in homes where they believe in mixed bathing and talked about the hypocrites that drank cocktails. And I've been in homes where they drank cocktail and talked about the hypocrites that smoked. <laughs> I mean, it'd be refreshing sometime to go into a home and have a guy look you right in the face and say, I'm a hypocrite. <laughs> but, but they never do that. It's always the other fella. A lady came to a friend of mine, his name is Cotton Mercer, he's an evangelist from down around there in Bruntstown, Florida. Jim Mercer, call him Cotton. And she came to Cotton Mercer and she had a big dip of tuberose in her mouth. That's snuff, if you don't know what it is. And she said, Preacher, she said, what do that verse of scripture mean that says, whatever not of faith is sin? You know. He looked around smacking the eyeballs and said, but what do you think it means? And she said, well, if I don't mean going to ball games on Sunday, I don't know what it do mean. <laughs> you see, they always think the other fellow's a hypocrite. It's a strange type of thing. Now, I stop this fellow right here. I say, pardon me, sir. Are you a Christian? Now, nah, preacher, before you go talking to me. He said, you go down and talk to old man so-and-so down the street. He said, he's a steward down there in the Methodist church, and he and me both drink out of the same bottle. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll go around and talk to him. So I stop this Methodist steward and I say, pardon me, sir, are you saved? Well, I hope I am. I hope you are too, are you? Well, I do the best I can. Well, the best thing you do is trust Christ your Savior. Have you done that? Oh, yes, yes, I've done that. Then you profess to be a Christian, right? Yeah. You uh, profess to be clad in a long white robe, treading the pilgrim pathway, right? That's right. Good. Uh, a little stout, you know, a little stout. <laughs> You know, he's in, the, he's in the gusto life, you know, Miller High life, you know. Um, you keep on fooling that stuff. You look like you swallow an air hose, man. You'll be a misformed, fitting poncho for 1967. You go on a water diet and gain 15 gallons. Uh, this kind of fell again on a, on a scale, and the card comes back and says, one at a time, please. <laughs> I say, all right, uh, you're, you're saved. Well, I profess to be. What you got in your hand? Oh, this little hot toddy. That don't get me wrong. I'm no drunkard. 
I can take it or leave it. Sam Jones said a man could take it or leave it, take it every time he got a chance. <laughs> but don't get me wrong, just look at you, believe you know, sidecar, boxcar, Manhattan martini, Singapore swing, full gin fish, you know, Bloody Mary, you know. Don't get me wrong, I'm no drunkard, you know, just a little bit, you know, on Christmas and Fourth of July and Thanksgiving and Armistice well, Day and Memorial Day and when I get up in the morning, but I'm no drunkard, don't get me wrong. You say, is that fella saved? He says, he is. You say, is he or ain't he? I don't know if he is, there he is. Now, don't go out here and say, Ruckman said a fella could be a Christian and drink liquor. I didn't say that. And don't go out of here and say, if a man took a drink of liquor, he'd lose his salvation. I didn't say that either. Don't go out, don't go out here and lie like a rug. I said, if he's saved, there he is. You know what the book says? The book says what? No, you're not your body of the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Can you glorify God in your body with that stuff? Right. fellow said, yes. Okay, poor. No problem, stupid. You ain't going to make a dime this morning. If it's right, do it. Amen. Amen. That's right. Come on, folks. If it's right, do it. Amen. Amen. If it's wrong, quit it. And if you can't quit it, boot yourself around the block. Don't you get upset with me, you hypocrite. I get so tired of pe people. I just don't think a preacher. Hey, man, if it's right, do it. If it's wrong, quit it. If you can't quit it, kick thine own self. Don't you kick me, you rascal. It ain't my problem. It's your problem. <laughs> Have a nice day. <laughs> You know something, if you knew me better than you know me, and most of you don't know me at all, you'd know that if you were standing where I'm standing, and I was sitting where you were sitting, and you was talking to me like I'm talking to you right now, and I thought I was right and thought you were wrong, I would just go right ahead and do it no matter what you said. If I thought I was right, I'd do it, and your opinion, I wouldn't even consult you. If I thought I was right, I'd do it. And if I thought I was wrong, I'd quit it. And if I couldn't quit it, I'd get mad at myself. Right. Amen? Amen. You know, folks are awful slow Amen. this morning, awful sticky today, trying to find some way to get around there. Huh? <laughs> if it's right, pour it, buddy. Skull, cheers, prost. <laughs> Somebody said, well, it's no worse than coffee. Okay, quit your coffee. <laughs> You're going to make a dime today. Well, it's no worse than Coca-Cola. All right, quit your soft drinks. Just quit the whole thing. Well, I think it's right. Okay, drink it. <laughs> Some people have got the most peculiar look on your face. <laughs> Did I ring your bell or something? If it's right, do it. Don't get worried about me. If it's right, do it. If it's wrong, quit it. If you can't quit it, kick yourself around the block, man. you got a problem. <laughs> Pardon me, madam, are you saved? I'm a member of the First Presbyterian Church. <laughs> oh, you say Presbyterian or lost Presbyterian? Here, here, young man, don't get fresh with me. <laughs> Lady, I'm going to get fresh. I just wonder if you're saved. Well, of course I'm saved. I'm not a heathen. <laughs> well, I didn't mean to dent your offender. I just wonder if you're saved. <laughs> you know, the hardest thing you ever had to do, you get people to say they're saved. You notice that? People in America, the cat's got the tongue or something. Are you saved? I joined the Baptist church when I was 12 years old. Are you saved? I'm an Episcopalian. <laughs> Are you saved? I'm a Catholic. <laughs> You're a Catholic? What's that? <laughs> Why, the word's not even in the Bible. The word isn't even in a Catholic Bible. I'm a Catholic. <laughs> I, I told a fellow one time, I said, Are you saved? He said, you see that, don't you? They showed me a ring. <laughs> Some folks are weird, man. You saved, you see that, don't you? I said, yeah, pretty ring, you know. I know what it was. He counted that ring to save my guess. 32nd degree below zero or something. I don't know what the thing was. <laughs> but you take, you know people in America crazy by the way they talk. How old are you? Five feet six. <laughs> are you married? No, I'm a Republican. <laughs> you know. How tall are you? 135 pounds. <laughs> They're crazy. Are you saved? I'm a Presbyterian. Are you saved? My father's a Methodist preacher. Are you saved? I joined the Lutheran church. What are you talking about? 
The hardest thing you ever had to do in your life is get people to say they're saved. Now, if you ever ask me if I'm saved and I say I'm a Baptist minister, I'll give you my God-given right this morning and knock me over the head with a jackhandle, man. The Baptist church didn't save me. I'm a Baptist. I'm not ashamed of being a Baptist. But the Baptist church couldn't save a dead horse, man. It's Jesus Christ that saves people. Is it so hard to say the name? Is it so hard? Are you saved? Yes, I was saved the 14th of March, 1949, at 10 o'clock in the morning in downtown Pensacola at the corner of Gregory and Palapoc Street, and Jesus Christ was alive and saved me. Amen. That's the answer to that question. That's right. What you got in your hand? Oh, spades, clubs, hearts, <laughs> diamonds, <laughs> deuces wild, you know. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I'm no gambler, you know, no seven-card stud, five-card draw, you know, just a little game of canasta, you know, rummy, <laughs> rook, you know. Getting awful quiet here, preacher. Sure. <laughs> Some of these folks lost their sense of humor, and I'm just getting started. I got, I'm not even halfway through yet. Now listen, what does the book say? The book says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all to the glory of God the Father, giving thanks to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. Can you do that for the glory of God? You say, yes. Okay, deal. No problem. Lord, bless this deal. Give me a good hand. <laughs> Cut. Thank you. Blackjack. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I mean, you never, you never got in a game of 21 bu or bust like that in your life, have you? Listen, if you can do it for God's glory and thank him for doing it, do it. And if you can't, quit it. And if you can't quit, get upset with somebody. Don't get upset with me. I just don't believe preachers have any right to shut your mouth. That's why you're sitting listening. I'm preaching. <laughs> I don't be getting a right. All right, you get called to preach and show us how to talk, okay? You say, she say, beats the fire out of me. She says she is. You say, well, is she or isn't she? She says she is. Well, if she is, there she is. Uh, pardon me, young lady, you say, oh, my, yes, it's the only way to be. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. <laughs> I say, what happened to your head? You get run over by a lawnmower or something? <laughs> you go to sleep in the barber's chair, you know? I mean, you know this kind. Hollywood says, cut it off, off it goes. Hollywood says, let it grow, it starts growing again. Hollywood says, take them up, up they come. Hollywood says, drop them, down they go. You know what that book says? That book says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renew of your mind, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know that book says, that book says that if you young people want to find the will of God, you got to be conformed to Christ, not the world. That's right. I had an old time preacher say one time, he said, the man in this life who is a success is the man who finds out what God wants him to do and does it. I believe that. But most of you young people are never going to find out what God wants you to do. Because they had conditions. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercy of God, you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly accepting to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed through your mind, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As long as you conform the world, kid, you can't find out what God wants you to do. In, speaking practically and scientifically, People like Eddie Murphy and, and, and Bill Cosby and Johnny Carson and Rock Hudson and <coughs> Dean Martin and, uh, and, uh, and Clinton, those people are failures. Amen. They're put up before you as great people because they have money and women and can cuss and drink and smoke and fornicate. That's the role model. Yeah. But they never find out what God wants them to do. Right. And they don't do it. They're failures. Do you mean to tell me that God put you down this earth for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years and never would tell you what he wants you to do while you're here? Well, I see what you got in your hand. Old TV romance, TV soap opera, screen love stories, boy meets girl, girl meets boy, boy loses a girl, boy gets girl, girl gets boy, boy gets boy, girl gets girl. <laughs> you say, well, that TV, TV or not TV, that is the question. You say, she saved, she says she is. Now listen, don't you go out here and say, Ruckman said everybody had television sets going to hell. <laughs> I didn't say that. And you say, well, you said it was all right for a Christian to watch television. I didn't say that either. You say, what did you say? I said, if she saved, there she is. You know what the Bible says? The Bible said the light of the body is the eye, not the ear. TV can do ten times the damage radio can do. Now listen, boys. 
you can't sin unless you've got images in your head to think with. And you can't get the images in your head to think with unless you've seen them. And you know where you've seen them. You say, is she saved? Says she is. fellow said one time, he said, there, there are 50 million bathtubs in America and 75 million television sets. He said, are you one of the 25 million unwashed viewers? <laughs> I was at a home one time in Georgia where a fellow was, he had a boy called a preacher. He was about 20 years old. This fellow was about 41. And while we were sitting there at the table eating with the family, he was unsaved, the daddy. His boy was saved and called a preach. And while we were sitting there eating, two fellows came in and hauled out the television set. And they hauled it out. I said to the man of the house, I said, are you getting a new one? He said, nope. I took a few more bites of black eyed peas and I said, uh, you getting that one fixed? He said, nope. I ate a little corn in the cob and I said, uh, were you trading in for another one? He said, nope. So I shut up for a while <laughs> and after about five minutes he said, you want to know what I haven't done with that? I said, what you haven't done with it? He said, preacher, before I got that blankety blank thing, I had me a family. And he said, now my kids won't come to the table when they're called. They all need glasses before they're 12 years old. They won't play outside. And he said, I had a family before I got that blankety blank thing. I'm going to have me one again. I went. That guy wasn't even saved. Sometime the children of this generation are, are wise in the children of light. I know an old boy got back from overseas, and some of those fellows come back from World War II. They had nightmares for years after they got home. And this fellow made the mistake of getting the television set and watching that series called Combat. They showed back there in the 1960s. And he'd go to bed at night and he's dreaming one night he's going up the hill firing a BAR. And the BAR fires, the recoil fires upward. You know, BAR, the, the gas recoil is forward instead of backward. You fire that thing, the muzzle right up on you. And in this dream, he's going up this hill firing this BAR and he's going, ba 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 ba. Then he'd change a clip and ba 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 and change a clip. Ba 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 ba. About the fourth clip he changed, you're the screen. And he woke up and he'd been taking his wife's hair colors out of her hair. <laughs> Going, bah, 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 bah. <laughs> I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll, I'll settle with you, okay? Will you spend half the time in the Bible you spend in front of the idiot box? How about that? You spend two hours in front of the bubble box? Okay, an hour in the book, okay? Come on, folks, you ain't going to find a deal like that again. When you get the judgment seat of Christ, the Lord ain't going to let you off that easy. You better take Ruckman's proposition. A lot more grace than that. I'll let you off for half, okay? Mm. Pardon me, sir, you saved. Am I saved? Yes, are you saved? Well, young man, don't you see my clerical collar? <laughs> Well, just because a fellow wears his collar on backwards, I don't mean he's saved. <laughs> he might just have a dirty collar or something, you know. <laughs> and I say, uh, let us one if you're saved. Why, well, young man, I know more about the Bible, you know, about if you live be a thousand. I know about homologamla and analogumina and pseudopigrapha and superlapse and inflapse and the circumplex ass and antipenal. What do you mean am I saved? <laughs> now, so I didn't mean a denture offender. I just want if you're saved. What you got under your hand there? Or an NIV. You know. Now listen, don't you go out here and say, Ruckman said, everybody doesn't have a King James Bible, you're going to hell. You got to be the King James Bible, you're going to hell. You know. You know, liars in this country, you lie like a Persian rug, you lie like a hound dog, boy. I never said that, never even thought that. You can be saved reading the NIV, you can be saved reading the Gospel tract. That's right. That's right. That doesn't mean the Gospel tract's a Bible. <laughs> That's right. But all the fundamentals are found in the RSV, you silly nut. All the fundamentals are found in the book on theology. And it isn't the Bible. But I'm an American. If you want to use an IV, okay. It's okay with me. I don't care. When it's RSV, help yourself. I'm even freedom, man. Boy, you put me in president, you'd see anarchy quick, boy. I'd let everybody just do just about as they pleased. Got that on a radio station, want to sell time. I'd put on Father Coughlin, then put on uh, Oliver Green, then put on Mae Jackson, then put on Jesse Jackson. <laughs> and I'd put on the Pope, and then put on the Black Muslims, put on the Weatherman, then put on Charles Fuller. <laughs> Just mix them all up, man. I believe in freedom. I don't care what kind of a Bible you use. Buy any cotton picking Bible you want to use. Just don't lie about it. Just don't get in the pulpit and say you believe this book is the Word of God when you don't believe it. That's the problem. That's what's wrong with Ruckman. 
You want the boys got against Ruckman? They, they pretend it's all kinds of things about Ruckman's personal life. That ain't the problem, honey. The problem is Ruckman gets on them for standing in that pulpit and saying, this is the word of God, this is inspired from, and they don't believe it. They're lying. And Ruckman will call the hand. They don't like that. Up at Bob Jones, you went up there to preach, you'd behind, find behind the pulpit a little uh, closet over here, and a sign hidden down there where nobody could see it, and the sign would say, when you preach from this pulpit, please use only a King James Bible. Why? To fool the suckers out front. To make them think you believe it. There's no sign like that in my pulpit. If you came to my pulpit and preached out of NSV and NIV, I wouldn't jump up in the middle of the sermon and say, heresy, throw him out. <laughs> I'd just sit there and enjoy it, man. Watch you make a fool out of yourself. <laughs> it means mean nothing to me. I've had guys come to my church and preach out of an NASV. I didn't know they were going to use it, but they did. I just let them go. My people sit there and they start going. <laughs> Pretty soon he knows he's in the wrong pew, boy. I saw an advertisement of the sword of the Lord one day about yay big on Jack Hiles. And it said, Hiles Anderson, where we use only the King James Bible. Boy, boy, now there's a Ruckmanite for one if you ever saw one. We don't use just the King James Bible at my school. We use 26 different versions. We use Moffat, Berkeley, Weymouth, Goodspeed, Phillips, ASV, New ASV, RV, RSV, New RSV, and I, 26 versions at my school. Oh, Dallas, we only the text of Receptus, not at my school. We use the West Cotton Horde Greek text from Nestles. You see the difference? We use all this stuff here, but don't believe it. We believe just one. Yeah. And they use the one we believe, but they believe all the rest of this junk. So they have to say, we use only this. You won't find that in my school, man. You come to my school, you'll study, study 26 different versions. you got to have some laughs, you know. <laughs> now, let me tell you something. Do what you want to do. It's a free country. But I'd be suspicious of any Bible that low-rated Jesus Christ. Amen, and the New King James Version denies the deity of Christ in Acts chapter 4. Yes, I know what the verse is. I point to it blindfolded. The New King James Bible denies that men corrupt the Scripture in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 4. Chapter 2, verse 17. The New King James Version denies that you should study the Word of God, 2 Timothy 2.15. The New King James Version denies the love of money is the rule of all evil. I know what's in that book. The New King James Version is not a King James Version. Neither is that one. That one there says God is not manifest in the flesh. That one there says that Joseph was Christ's father in Luke 2.33. If you want to use it, help yourself. It's your funeral, not mine. My Bible said that he may have the preeminence in all things. And a Bible don't give him the permanent place, I ain't going to fool with it. Pardon me, sir, are you saved? Yes, sir, glory to God, hallelujah, blessed Jesus, I'm saved, sanctified, have the initial evidence, the baptism, the Holy Ghost, talking in other tongues, whoopee. <laughs> I say, good brother, how'd you get saved? Oh, bless God, glory to God, hallelujah, praise you, Jesus, bless the Lamb. I went out of the altar and prayed through, glory. <laughs> I say, good, you pray through to God or pray through to the devil? Oh, to God, of course, of course, of course, why? Nothing, just checking. What you got in your mouth? Oh, have a Tampa, you know, Red Dot, Muriel, White Owl, you know, Chesterfield, Palm Isle, you know, Camel, you know. You say, is he saved? <laughs> I don't go out and say we had a preacher down there, Brother Sawyer's church, he said, everybody what smokes is a going to hell. I didn't say that. You dirty liar, you slander you, you blab mouth. I didn't say that. You say, but you say a Christian could smoke? I didn't say that either. You see, you're kind of indefinite today, aren't you? <laughs> you know, if he say there he is. A fellow came to Dwight L. Moody one time, and he said, uh, Brother Moody, can you give me the verse in the Bible against smoking? He said, no, I'll give you one for it. He said, what's that? He said, let him that's filthy be filthy still. <laughs> <laughs> some, <laughs> some of you lost your sense of humor again, you know. It's, uh, you ever stop? Tobacco is a filthy weed from the devil it doth proceed. It uh, stains your fingers, burns your clothes, makes a chimney of your nose. 
I mean, Walt Garrison said, well, too good to smoke. I threw mine. A filthy habit. Baseball picture of Stanley Brown. Do you know a fly won't land that mess when you spit it out? Do you know that? <laughs> would you put something in your mouth that a fly wouldn't land on? <laughs> Have you ever seen some of the stuff that flies land on? <laughs> telling you, man. I don't know how many times I've been making a hospital call and going up there and going to the hospital and found a fellow up there about 55 or 60, sometime one of my church members, somebody, sometimes somebody else's church member. You get up there and you come in that room and man, has got a stink in there to put a bust on a brick wall of 50 feet and a bunch of stubbed out ashtrays with a cigarette bust on them. You know, boys, kissing a girl that smokes is kind of like licking an ashtray. <laughs> And you come and smell that stink in there, and here's this fellow lying there in bed, and you say, what's the matter? Well, <clears throat> I don't know, Brother Rock. <laughs> taking a few tests on me here. <clears throat> I think it's a little bit of <laughs> 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 Well, I know what's wrong with him. He's dying. That's what's wrong with him. He's dying, man. I mean, up here, I guess some of you have fireplaces, and you burn uh, kindling, you know, wood in the winter, and every now and then you have to ch have a chimney sweep come there and clean that thing out. Now, when you smoke and smoke and smoke, that's what builds up inside the lung. It's charcoal. And that lung was about that big, and pretty soon that lung was about that big, and pretty soon that lung was about that big, and pretty soon that lung about that big. You go up there and talk out a boy in the oxygen tent, and he's lying there going, <laughs> You know what the trouble is? That lung is about the size of a golf ball. It won't hold it in the air. It ought to go, see, it ought to go. Like that. Not. Don't tell me God's in that. That Bible says, Wherefore, beloved, cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holy. You saw still get this right. Okay, do it. Yeah. I'd like to see me when I finish here light up one, you know. <laughs> I'm not going to, but it's supposed to be finished tonight. And I said, Well, folks. Uh, <laughs> 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 I mean, I mean, I'm not about to do it, but suppose I did. Now, how that would how would that strike you? You say, well, Ruckman, you're a preacher and you shouldn't smoke. Oh, don't give me that stuff, okay? These verses I'm quoting you aren't written to preachers. They're written to Christians. That's right. What? No, you're not your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I'll not be brought under the power of any. What do you mean, Preacher. Who was it? Who was it that taught you folks that you have one set of moral standards and I'm given another set? Where did you get that from? Who taught you the preacher how to live some kind of an ultra super life that you don't have to live? Where did you get that from? You didn't get it out of that Bible. I got stomach, lung, kidney, liver, chest, eyes, ears, nose, so just like you got. Those verses I quote to you are written to Christians. All things are lawful for me. I can do it. But I'll not be brought out of the power of any. The idea of something that long dictating to you what you to do. Well, brothers, Ruckman is no worse than coffee. Okay, quit the coffee. <laughs> you can't make a dime tonight. I preached one time in a, in a, in a Bible conference with Lester Roloff down at Bob Gray's church in Jacksonville. And me and Lester Roloff always got on real good. I've been to several Bible conferences with him. We always, we got along real good. Uh, we're very much alike, but not at all really. We just think alike. He raised in the country, I was raised in the city. He never had a military duty, I had a lot of military duty. He had only a college education, I had six years of seminary beyond. There was nothing about it was similar in our background. He raised in a Christian home, I was raised in the streets. But we, th we think alike. And we get meetings, we, we, we had a ball. I always enjoy being with him. I'd go out and eat with him, you know, and I'd kind of, kind of goad him, you know. But he's good sports, you know, he'd, he'd take it. I, I'd sit down next to him, he'd order his Melba toast, you know, and his salad without any dressing on it, you'll not get me a barbecue pork sandwich with onions, you know, and then take some Tabasco sauce and dump it all over there. <laughs>
But he's a good sport. But she didn't go to meet him. Then we had a meeting one time out of Bob Gray's church, and that meeting was over. A lady came around to me, and she said, it's awful. It's awful. It's just terrible. It's the most horrible thing in the world. I said, what? She said, this meeting. <laughs> and I said, what's wrong with this meeting? She said, well, Brother Roloff took our Coca-Colas from us, and our coffee and our tea. You took our television and magazines from it. And then Brother Roloff took this uh, diet, gave us this diet, and took this uh, pork away from us, and then you t uh, cigarettes away from us, beer, and then you take our Bible versions away from us. We haven't got nothing left. <laughs> and I said, well, you're still going to head march, and she said, yes. I said, beat's going to hell, don't it, man? <laughs> Folks, if it's right, do it. And if it's wrong, quit it. If you can't quit it, just shut your mouth about the preacher. You ain't got no business talking about the preacher. Just talk about yourself. I see this young lady walking down the street. I say, pardon me, ma'am, are you saved? And it says, I'm not a she, I'm a he. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I say, you are. <laughs> well, you couldn't prove by me, you know. I'm, you know, five feet six and hair six feet three. You take, uh, folks say, how long is long? Well, the Bible said a woman's hair is given to her for a covering. So if you have hair that covers your ears or the back of your neck, or your forehead, you have a woman's hair. A woman's hair either covers her ears or the back of her neck or her forehead. And if you've got that kind of hair, you've got a woman's hair. You're welcome. <laughs> folks, folks today, folks today, America, this is a thin skin, this is a thin skin sissies. I'm not going back at Chuck again and talk about my hair. I'll talk about your belly before I'm through. <laughs> That's right, brother, and your mother, and your father, and your friends. Amen, amen, amen. And the old time preachers didn't stop with your hair, man. They got, they preach about your mouth and your ears and everything else. What a generation. You take, I stopped a guy down the street one time. I said, are you saved? He said, yes. I said, you, you piqued my curiosity. I said, I'm going to ask you a question. I said, why do you want to look like a woman? He said, I'm not a woman. I said, I didn't say you were. I just said, why do you want to look like one? He said, well, I'm a man. You better believe it. I said, I know that. But why do you want to look like a woman? He said, if you don't think I'm a man, just, I said, are you hard of hearing? <laughs> what do you want to look like a woman for? If you're sane and normal, why, what are you, a hypocrite or something? Why do you want to look like something you're not? We've got a great age. We just, these queers and fruits and the faggots and double-breasted finks and dykes, I mean, I know what, they're not gays. I mean, they're, they're, they're fruit loops. Afghanistan, Bananistan. But you take that bunch, they're so sensitive. We just want to be accepted. Blow it out your nose, but I don't want to be accepted. Why is it that all these people want to be accepted? Accepted by who? I don't ask you to accept me. If you don't like me, you can take a flying jump in the moon. I could care less. Isn't that strange? We just want to be accepted. Why? I don't know a white male in this country in his right mind that wants to be accepted by anybody except the folks he wants to accept. I'm accepted by enough of people to keep me happy. I don't have to court you, man. Amen, amen, amen. What is this peculiar thing? We just want to be accepted. Get out, amen. brother. You know what I think it is? My Bible says I'm accepting the beloved. Jesus Christ has accepted me. Now, once you have his acceptance, what do you care about the rest of them for? Something going wrong there, man. I mean, that thing right there. I, I go to the spa once in a while and pump a little iron, you know, very little. At my age, you know. I mean, at my age, it isn't bodybuilding, it's care and maintenance. <laughs> but I go there, I go and watch them in that spa, these big old, you know, Around a mirror, you know. hey. I mean, some of them spend more time from the mirror than they do pumping the iron. And I'll tell you, there's something I never got used to. You see a guy in there, you know, bench pressing 400 pounds, you know, he's King Kong, man, the shoulders come out of his ears, you know, 18 inch neck. And after he finishes pumping that iron, he goes back and he gets his hair dryer and he goes, Bzzz. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> so much, I just I never got used to that. It's got muscle like a bull ape and goes back then. <laughs> Strange genes and chromosomes, boy. <laughs> you know, back in the old days, 
uh, 10 years ago, you couldn't tell what it was as looking at it from behind, but when it turned around, you could tell what it was, you know. But nowadays, after they turn around, you still don't know what it is. <laughs> Out in California, that, what was filth week last week at Washington, D.C.? I think that was filth week when all those faggots and, and, and pimps and queers showed up there. A bunch of them got married. Do you, whatever you are, take whatever this is to be whatever you're trying to be? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like, it's kind of like Michael Jackson, you know. That thing ain't black and it ain't white. And it ain't male and it ain't female. And it ain't an adult and it ain't a child. I don't know what it is. It's a mystery program. <laughs> it's the thing from outer space. I mean... I believe in aliens from outer space, all these couldn't be ours. That fella, that, that fella, that fella is the world's greatest neuter, that bird. Yes, sir. And I was, I had a, I had a meeting one time, brother Noe in Livoni, a matter of fact, just last, uh, last November, I reckon it was, and I went to a Denny's or a Shoney's or some fast food dump there, and I was eating breakfast, and there was something waiting on me, and they waited on me for 20 minutes, and as God is my witness to this day, I couldn't tell you what that thing was. I'm for 20 minutes right at the table at the counter. I don't know what it was. I, look, I said, the face is a man. My hair is a woman. No, up part of the body is a man. And all the hips is a woman. All the legs are a man. It talks like a woman. I don't know what it was. It, it was a thing. <laughs> you say, are those things saved? Beats the fire out of me. Beats the fire out of me. They say they are. If they are, there they are. And then I'll take a, take a look over here. Here's a, here's a fellow. Pardon me, sir, you saved? Yeah, what of it? But I just wonder if you're saved. Yeah, I am. I don't discuss religion and politics. Get out of here. <laughs> you're born again, huh? Yeah, what business is yours? Beat it. Really got the joy, joy down your heart, don't you, man? <laughs> um, you ever meet one of those fellows? What that Bible says? That Bible says, uh, be not hasty in my spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. Oh, uh, wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who can stand before envy? You take a fellow like that blowing off all the time, you say, is he saved? You know, you men, it's kind of funny about something. Before you get saved, you call it temper. And after you get saved, you call it nerves. But it all comes out the same way. A fellow said one time to Billy Sunday, he said, well, I blow up, but it's all over in a minute. And Billy said, so is a shotgun blast, and it blows everything to smithereens. <laughs> A fellow said one time to Andrew Jackson, he said, Andrew Jackson, you ought to control your temper. He said, shut up, you fool, I control more temper in a week than you do in a month. <laughs> now, the thing about a man is a man is supposed to have temper. So you get a good case-hardened blade that'll hold an edge, it's going to have temper to it. A man is supposed to have temper. You just ain't supposed to lose it. You see? Be not hasty in my spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. Now, you take this lady here. She doesn't drink, she doesn't smoke, she doesn't dance, she doesn't dip, she doesn't spit, she doesn't chew, she doesn't go with them to do. And she goes to church, and she ties, she prays and reads her Bible, but my stars, look at that tongue. <laughs> you know what that Bible says? That Bible says a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. That Bible said a hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor. That Bible said the tongue is a world of iniquity and set on course the fire the course of nature will set on fire hell. I don't know how much you read your Bible, how much you don't, but if you take your Bible and get your little uh, liner, a uh, little color liner and go through there and mark the sins of tongue, lips, and mouth, you'll find they outnumber any other sin in that Bible outside of idolatry. They have more reference about the sin of the tongue than any other sin. Go through Proverbs and mark them. Psalms and mark them. Um, the tongue is a world of iniquity. There is that that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, like a serpent. The poison of adders is under their lips. I know a fellow one time that got 22 million people killed and never fired a shot. He did finally fire one shot, blew his own brains out. Before he did, he got 22 million people killed. You know what he did it with? He did it with his mouth. Adolf Hitler. He just spoke and talked. Now you take, you take Christians, you have a problem with that. I know Christians. Now brethren, there are many things in life I know nothing about. And I don't say that with a 
false humility. I mean, I'm real stupid along a lot of lines. Where I'm stupid, I keep my mouth shut. You never heard me talk about mechanics or appliances or much about physics or astronomy. There's some things I'm very dumb about. But you people here, you Christian the local church, boy, do I ever know you. I've been in 800 churches in 44 years. Anywhere from this size and smaller up to 4,000. And if I know one thing on this earth, I know the Lord's sheep. I know you. You won't fool with me. I've had to deal with you for almost a half a century. And I know you. You know what you do? You quit your smoking and quit your drinking and quit your dancing and quit your gambling. And you make up for it with your big mouth. It's what you do. I mean, that woman that got saved, well, she may have got saved, but let me tell you something. Just the other day, I saw blah, 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 And I passed this car. I saw it parked right next to it. Blah, 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 blah. You couldn't count the congregation been torn apart by some old long tongue her- uh, sister like that. <laughs> Talking that way. In a multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. The lady said, well, the men gossip too. Yeah, they do. They do. But two men, you watch one man, he'll say something, this guy listen, he'll say something back, and this guy listen, say something back. But two women get together, they go, <laughs> they get through, they don't know what they said. Now, do you know what people all around this church are trying to do? I know what they're trying to do. I don't have to even meet them. I don't have to even meet them. I know what they're up to right now. Any 20,000 within 10 miles of this church, I know what they're doing. They're trying to find happiness. That's what they're all trying to do. You know what they do? They watch you people to see if you're happy. When they hear you people gripe and groan and moan and complain, you know what they figure? They figure you ain't got any more than they got. If this church is ever empty, it's because you people talk too much in front of unsaved people about the wrong stuff. Our pastor, well, you know, the phone's not as good as they used to be. Well, our specials aren't as good as they used to be. Well, I don't like the color scheme in that church, but the light hurts my eyes. Well, the parking, uh, a parking lot looks like a minefield. So-and-so's baby bit my baby in the nursery, and blah, 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 blah. You know what happens. Unsafe people watch that stuff and listen to that stuff. You know what they figure? They figure you haven't got any more than they got. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So watch your big mouth when you're around other people. Amen. Oh, and isn't that a crew? Isn't that a crew? I see this lady over here. I'm ashamed to draw her face. I'm not going to draw it. Just leave it a blank. You say, why? Well, she doesn't drink. She doesn't smoke. She doesn't dance. Doesn't believe in mixed bathing. Doesn't play cards. Goes to church, tithes, reads her Bible. But she wouldn't walk around the block to tell a sinner how to get saved. You say, is she saved? I don't know. Maybe she is. Maybe you can be saved and never witness. Maybe you can. I don't see how you can. The Bible says, out of the abundance of man's heart, his mouth speaks. Uh, that, that Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It doesn't say, let your works shine. It says, let your light shine. Now, if you talk about Jesus Christ and brag about Jesus Christ, don't you worry about them noticing you. They'll notice you. You know what's wrong a lot of men down south? A lot of men down south, good old boys, they say, well, Brother Ruckman, I'm saved, but I don't believe in talking about it. I believe in living it. And I believe in living instead of talking about it. A lot of folks talking about it ain't going to heaven. They got that thing wrong. You know what their problem is? Their problem if they get talking about Jesus Christ, folks will really begin to watch them, and they don't want to be watched too closely. You know why preachers' kids are watched closer than anybody else's kids? If he's any kind of a preacher? Because if he's any kind of preacher, he talks about Jesus Christ. That's why folks examine him. And they'll find a flaw in him or nobody could find a flaw in him. And if preachers watch your kids as close as you watch ours, we'd see some holes too. But most of you play it safe. You cool it. You keep your mouth shut. I talk to these old southern boys. Well, brother, Rupp and I just don't believe in talking about it. And then I sit around here and say, well, I was out there in that pond. I took this snow or six-pound test line, threw it out there, had a bucktail stream in that thing, a little weedless sally on it. I was coming through there, you know, I think I had a pork rind on there. And about the time this bass... You don't talk about it, huh? Well, we're out to the stand. You know what? I've been out there standing since about five o'clock in the morning. I was already about that time with this thing behind me. And law me, man, tell you, I made a mistake. I done flipped on my cigarette lighter and this eight-pound buck came. Uh-huh. You know what you do? 
you talk about what you're interested in. And the reason why you don't talk about Jesus Christ is because you ain't interested in him. Now, maybe you're saved. I would say you're lost. Maybe you are, but if you are, there you are. <laughs> Isn't that a group? Isn't that a crew? You know what I've just drawn you? I've just drawn you a picture of the professing church of Jesus Christ on this earth. Now, I don't say they're all saved. I don't say they're all lost. I'm just saying when an unsaved man looks around for Jesus Christ, this is what he sees. He sees that right there. Now, don't, don't misunderstand me. I don't say they're all saved. Don't say I said something I didn't say. I'm like Bud Robinson, the old-time Methodist preacher. He'd always say, don't say I said something I didn't say. <laughs> he had a little impediment in his speech, and he'd lisp. He'd say, don't say I said something I didn't say. <laughs> he was a founder of the Nazarenes. Bud Robinson preached out in uh, California one time for Bob Schuler, not Robert Schuler, you know, the Glide Memorial freak. Uh, Bob Schuler, who's an old-time Methodist from Virginia. And uh, old man uh, 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 Bud Robertson came here the first night and said, Now, preacher, just tell me what to get on this meat and I'll get on it. And, uh, and Bob Schuler said, Well, Bud, Rob, Bud, he said, we got a bad case in this church. We got some tobacco-chewing Methodist stewards. And Bud said, Oh, my, my, that's bad. I'll have to get on that. And he preached three nights on chewing tobacco. Three nights. And man, the fourth night, that congregation was mad at him, about ready to chew up nails and spit out the rust. And that bunch of stewards sitting down there just glaring at him. And the fourth night, he got up and said with his sweetest smile, Now, folks, I'm going to bring you a message tonight on the second coming of Christ, but I believe the Lord had me bring you a special message on tobacco, Sean. <laughs> and then he started. And when he started, he said, Now, don't say I said something I didn't say. I didn't say that a Methodist steward charged the back with going to hell. I don't know what I said. Don't say I said that. But what I said was, I don't see how any Methodist steward could chaw something that he was afraid to swallow. <laughs> and he got into it. <laughs> so don't you, don't you say, you know, I said something I didn't say. I didn't say they're all saved, but there they are. Now look at them. They walk along the pilgrim pathway, and the world says, come in. And the disco will say, come in. And the council of churches says, come in. And the associations say, come in. And the UN says, come in. And the dance halls say, come in. And the swimming pools say, come in. And God says, come out, come out, come out. Come out, my mum and be separate, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And ye shall be sons and daughters to me, saith the Lord Almighty. The word ecclesia, brethren, means a call out, out, out assembly. Not call in, call out. On his Christ, Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures, and was buried, and he rose again the third day from the dead according to the Scriptures. Wherefore he is able to save the uttermost, all them that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And he's a living Savior. He's alive. For two thousand years he's been standing at the crossroads of eternity, inviting men to come to him. Down there in Pensacola, Florida, several years back, we had a middle school teacher uh, talked to a class, and she said, boys and girls, I want to have you write down the name of the most uh, famous living man living today. And some of those kids wrote down, you know, Eisenhower, you know, and Churchill, and Billy Graham, a bunch of other goony birds. And one kid wrote down, Jesus Christ. And she, when the paper came in, she said, Jimmy, that's a wonderful idea, but I asked for somebody who is living. And Jimmy said, he is. <laughs> See, Jimmy knows something the teacher didn't know. And I died for your sin according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again the third day from the dead. And for 2,000 years he'd been inviting sinners to come to him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Come now, saith the Lord, let us reason together, though that your sin be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like trim, they shall be as wool. The Holy Spirit invites men to come to Christ, the bride invites men to come, and whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. And he points his finger right down this old sinner's throat, and he says, You... Come on. You're dead in trespass in sin. You're clad in the filthy rags of your own self-righteousness. You're headed for hell. Come on, get saved. And blessed is the man that knows when God's talking with him. You know what our trouble is? We always think he's talking to somebody else. Blessed is the man that knows when God's putting the finger on him. I count the happiest day of my life, the 14th of March, 1949, when I was down in Pensacola drinking myself to death with no family and alone in the world without hope and without God, 
and headed for a devil's hell and a flop house staying there, ten cents a bed and a can to spit in. And I was kneeling there in the dark, and the Holy Spirit put his finger down to me and said, Ruckman, you're going to hell. Just like that. You're going to hell. And I remember I looked around my room, you know, to see if I could find somebody else to whom I could refer the message. <laughs> and there was nobody there but me. <laughs> you're going to hell. I found Jesus Christ in less than 12 hours. But the trouble is when God says you, you say her, him, them, that, these, those, this, see. And God says you, you're lost, you need to be saved. Come to the fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all the guilty stains. He points his finger at that fellow and says, come, and you know what this fellow says? This fellow says, nothing to him. He says, they. Now get that, they. And then God says, you. And he says, them, those, thee, that. God says, you. And he says, nothing to him. They aren't any cleaner than I am. That's why many a fellow goes to hell. You're looking around too much. You're too curious, stupid. You quit thinking for five minutes, you get saved. You're too smart. Just shut your mouth about five minutes and bow your head and close your eyes and shut your mouth and turn off your brain for about five minutes, you'd find Christ. That's right. But you're so smart, aren't you? Yeah, I've seen this and I've seen that and I've seen, you just, you do your good deal to learn how to quit thinking for a while. And just look, trust something by faith. This fellow says, they're no cleaner than I am. Now look at here. You see this fellow here? I may take a little drink to steady my nerves, but at least I don't go around sticking my nose in everybody else's business. This lady here, I'm going to have a friendly little game of cards with my friend, but at least I don't uh, smoke and drink like some Christians in my, in my church. This fellow here, I may worry about my pension and retirement, but at least I'm not worldly like my church members. You see what I mean, Jelly Bean? <laughs> you know what they're doing? They're all judging each other. You know what he said over there in Proverbs? There's a generation that is pure in their own eyes and yet are not washed in their filthiness. Every man will proclaim his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Paul says they compare themselves among themselves and measuring themselves by themselves are not wise. Now, you know what the biggest hypocrite in that picture is? I'm going to put a circle around him. He's right there. You know why? That bird knows what to do, and God's told that bird what to do, and he's hiding mine and somebody else to get out of doing it. They don't make him any bigger than that. Brethren, when I want to compare myself with Christians to see what kind of a Christian I am, and we all do it unconsciously, I'm we were told to look unto Jesus, go off and finish with our faith, and the idea is we're not to compare ourselves with any man but just with Jesus Christ. But the truth is we'll do it. We'll just do it by instinct. When I find myself trying to judge my Christian growth, my maturity, alongside another Christian, you know what kind of Christian I pick? I never pick one of my own congregation. I always pick a Christian like Harlan Popoff, or Richard Vermbron, or John Wesley, or Martin Luther. I pick me a big one. I pick me a big one. I don't pick me a little one. By then, you know what the secret of the Christian life is? If not to see how much you can get away with before you cross the line, the secret of the Christian life is what can you give up for his sake and take up your cross and deny yourself and follow him. Amen. There are two ways modern Christians have seen how far they can go before they cross the line. You know why we have you bow your head and close your eyes and invitation? You ever wonder about that? You know why that is? It's because if you look, you can't see anything that's eternal. My body, that isn't eternal, it's going to rot. If the Lord comes, you're not going to look at that body anyway, it's going to change. You set building, it's going to burn. Set ground out there, those environmentalists so worry about, it's going to be burned to a crisp. The Lord's got an ecological program where he's going to burn it, Second Peter chapter 3. Whatever you look at is going to go. So we have you bow your head and close your eyes so you'll be cut off with the stuff that's permanent. What you see is temporary. And the idea is when you buy your head and close your eyes, it's a face-off. That's what they call in hockey. It's one-on-one. -on -one. It's you and Jesus Christ. You know why we do that? Because one day, 
bless my soul, one day that's how it's going to be with every cotton picking one of us. Someday I'm going to stand up there, no wife, no kids, no congregation, no deacons, no friends, no just me and Jesus Christ. Okay, Ruckman, give an account. You know what I'd do if I was you? I'd get the stuff settled here before I got there. I'd settle it right here before I hit the place. All right, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father... We ask the best upon the message this morning. I know I've been kind of long-winded today, and I hope I haven't kept these people anything that's really important, but if I know the Word of God, there's nothing more important than just being ready to meet Thee. And You said every one of us should give account of himself to God. And I know every person I'm talking to now will have to give an account someday, and, and they won't be able to hide behind anybody. And Lord, I, I feel for some of them. Some have real temptations and real burdens, and for someone, it's going to be very difficult to give up some of these things. And they're going to need a lot of grace to do it. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, you might give them some help. I can't live the lives for them. Brother Sawyer can't go home and live the family problems for them. After they leave this church this morning and, and head out the new meal, once again, it'll be just them and thee and the devil, and they're going to have to settle it. And I pray they'll settle it now before they go. Now let's join in prayer, please. Head bowed, nice, closed, just you and the Lord. And maybe I didn't turn over your rock this morning, but I turned over a lot of them. A lot of bugs crawling around. And maybe I missed yours. But if God has spoken to you this morning about something specific, you're going to have to give up. Before we sing any invitation or close the service, why don't you ask God for grace? And you're going to need it, some of you. Some of you folks think it's easy to give up smoking. You can't understand why people smoke. You would, if you'd smoked two packs a day for 20 years, you'd understand why it's hard to give up. And some other things, what's easy for you won't be easy for somebody else. Ask God, say, Lord Jesus, I want to do your will. I want to do what you want me to do. I haven't got the strength to do it. Give me grace to do it. And whatever it takes to make me so I can do your will, give it to me. I want to please just you. And you take that line and you can't miss. Father, bless the Word of God. Bless the invitation. Have your will this morning with everybody in this congregation. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let's stand. Let's stand. Pastor, come ahead and close the service here out. And the Lord leads you.